been fighting a long time, and we have all lost so very much, so many loved ones gone. But you are not alone. There are pockets of resistance all around the planet. We are at the brink. You have no idea how important you are. If you're listening to this, you are the resistance. Ave Maria Stella. Salvete! How about they found a damn? <laughs> this whole thing's gonna be in Latin, by the way, guys. Uh, just kidding. Uh, welcome, Father Jason Barone of the Veterum Sapientiae Institute, here to talk to us about the encyclical, the institute, and all good things Latin. So, Father, welcome. Thanks, Steve. Thanks for having me on. And for all the holy people in there watching, can you lead us off in a prayer? <laughs> Absolutely. In nomine Patri, sit fidei et spiritu sancti. Amen. Veni sancti spiritus. Reple tu orum corda fidelium, et tui amores in eis ignum acende. Emite spiritum tuum me creabuntur, et renovabis facim terre. Oremus. Deus qui corda fidelium, sancti spiritus illustratione docuisti. Da nobis in eodum spiritu recta sapere, et de eus semper consolatione gaudere. Per Christum Dominum nostrum. Amen. In nomine Patris et Filii et Spiritus Sancti. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Father. So, Viterum Sempientiae. Now, years ago, you did a sermon on this. And uh, I, to be honest, I didn't know that this encyclical even existed. And I'm sure in the sermon you said, you basically said the same thing. And most priests don't even have the Latin language down that's in their diploma. So, mm -hmm. what is this? It's an encyclical by Pope St. John XXIII. Uh, what's the gist of this? Yeah, so it's uh, probably the most ignored papal document of the 20th century. Uh, virtually nobody knows uh, about it, despite the fanfare with which it was received. So uh, it's technically an apostolic constitution, even though like all over the internet it does say encyclical. And so that means it's kind of a big deal. Um, and so popes don't issue, issue those you know, every day. And so it was just months before uh, Vatican II even opened. And I think it had an eye towards Vatican II, uh, just to say, because I think there were already rumblings against Latin, even at that point as they're heading into the council. And I think Pope St. John the Twenty-Third wanted to fly his flag uh, high and, and proudly on the issue of Latin. So on the Feast of the Chair of St. Peter, February 22nd, 1962, uh, Pope John, had dozens of cardinals, hundreds of bishops, and thousands of priests and seminarians fill St. Peter's Basilica. And from what I'm told, on the high altar of St. Peter's, signed with full ceremony, this incredible apostolic constitution called Veterum Sapientia, literally, which means the wisdom of the ancients, uh, meaning just uh, from the ancient world, the, the great uh, Latin and Greek writers. Uh, and it was a huge deal. And then about five minutes later, the Second Vatican Council started and it kind of disappeared. <laughs> so. Paper what paper? <laughs> yeah, exactly, exactly. It made quite a splash, I think, initially. And some people were excited. Other people were rather despondent and distressed because they wanted to get rid of Latin. Uh, but then I think the, the council just stole the show. I mean, it was just eight months away from beginning. Mm. And so it took all the attention and, you know, as we know, I mean, there was one trajectory going into the council, but then like on day one, the schemata are voted down and it's like, all right, fresh start, a new direction. But I think that this apostolic constitution was meant to anticipate that original trajectory, you know, probably in line with those original uh, schemata that were to be the preparatory documents of the council. But things changed. And so this document goes down as one of the most forgotten ever. Now, you mentioned being signed on the altar. Is that not common? I mean, was he just in the vicinity? The the guy from the, the paper boy showed up with it to sign? It was the only thing he had? Or is that was there something behind that? Well, I think, what else could he have done to say, this is important? Yeah. And in fact, I mean, the, the, the conciliar documents didn't even, uh, they weren't even signed on the, on the high altar. 
Um, and so, no, it's a very, very rare thing. Uh, but I think he was anticipating some some pushback. He probably felt the winds of change and um, said, look, this is serious. And it's not only the Apostolic Constitution, which is you know known by very few, but even fewer people know about the document that came out two months later, the Ordinaciones. Mm -hmm. So in other words, at the end of the Apostolic Constitution, John, Pope John calls for the Congregation for uh, Catholic Universities and Seminaries to put together curriculum. So step by step, how this document is to be implemented seminary by seminary. And so um, virtually nobody knows about this document, but it is the real deal. And it includes apostolic uh, visitors to come and visit your seminary, your diocese, your religious orders to investigate whether or not Veterum Sapientia and the curriculum uh, was properly being implemented. They even have a draft um, report in the appendix of what these visitators would have to send back to the Vatican in terms of <laughs> what seminaries are doing. Like you can only imagine like a windowless van showing up in front of a, a seminary with the visitators coming out. And I mean, John Pope John couldn't have done this any more seriously, I think. But then before too long, he had passed and the you know, council was heading in a new direction and these things just go forgotten. So what are some great lines, I guess? I mean, it's not a law. It's not like today when you get a 12,000 page encyclical and, uh, you know, words that you're not, too big to know. This is rather short, but right to the point, right? Uh, yes, and it's meant not to be just a, uh, a document praising Latin. But it is an apostolic constitution, and it does prescribe particular things to, to occur. So, for instance, it calls for a Latin academy to be erected at a pontifical university in order to help facilitate the implementation of this document. It calls on that congregation to develop a curriculum. It asks for visitations in order to make sure it's being implemented. And so, yeah, we can definitely go through various ecclesial and papal documents and say, oh, well, they're just saying nice things about X, Y, or Z. Uh, but at the end of the day, sometimes it does come down to requirements and law. And we can even look into what canon law has to say. It doesn't really say much in the 1983 code, but it is there. It says that the uh, students, the seminarians, ought to be bene calia, that is pretty well calloused, uh, having worked with Latin so much, they have calluses on their hands, and so they should know the Latin language well. So that is enshrined in law. Uh, and then you have these other, so you have a, a, a decree like, or an absolute constitution like uh, Venom Sapientia, but then it's gonna rely on other things, for instance, like the Ordinaciones, that curriculum. And then, for instance, the documents that govern uh, seminary formation, the program for priestly formation, for instance, which governs American sem uh, seminaries, that also uh, talks about the importance of, of Latin. So it is, um, I would have to say that the, uh, the curriculum from the Ordinaciones is the, is the most explicit, all right, this is what is required mm -hmm. from our seminaries. But then they didn't enforce it. So. <laughs> <laughs> all right, so why is this even important? I mean, I, I think I remember hearing or reading that uh, Diane Mertzer, I think that's how you pronounce her name, uh, wrote about how the Protestants had to kill the, the church fathers to destroy, basically Catholicism, try to destroy Catholicism. But now you, if you kill the language, you kill your tradition, your your the forefathers. Is that the is that a way that the guys that were trying to basically go after attack the language itself? Because you have Alphonsus, the moral theology is written in Latin. Bellarmine is written in Latin. You got all these great works written in Latin and now nobody can read them. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so what might be the motivation for those who were challenging the Latin language? And yeah, we can just conjecture, I suppose. Um, but you look at what Latin represents, and maybe by what it represents, you could hypothesize, well, what was it that they were wanting to, uh, to either change or attack or go a different direction in? And so you know, Pope John, he mentions the three qualities of the Latin language that is unique to Latin. Uh, and one, for instance, is that it's a universal language. It's not just the language of one country uh, or one area, but rather be precisely because it's not a living language, it's a quote unquote dead language, although it lives in different ways. 
uh, it's, as he says, gives no rise to jealousies. He doesn't uh, favor one country over another. But what does that say to have a universal language that sort of connotes universal truth, right? Yeah. So, you know, and you have the issue, for instance, um, of uh, communion for the divorced and remarried. You know, how could it be morally licit on one side of a country's line, for instance, in Germany, uh, based on what those German bishops, uh, the conference is wanting, but then you cross a line into Poland and it's illicit. It would be considered sinful uh, to uh, frequent the sacraments without you know, the proper regularization of uh, marriage, et cetera. And so that might be an example, the fact that Latin is a universal language. It bespeaks universal truths that do not change from country to country or from uh, hemisphere to hemisphere. So there's that. There's the fact also that uh, Pope John says Latin is immutable. It doesn't change. And I think that's important, too, because guess what? The faith doesn't change. Truth doesn't change. And so what the fathers and doctors and what previous councils you know, throughout the centuries have said and enshrined their teachings in a language that does not change, well, that should be able to speak to us today, too, because that language uh, and that truth is the same. And Latin does a beautiful job of, of reflecting that because the, lang the language itself really doesn't change. Unlike, you know, we look at uh, the English language and just it's like each week a, a new word has a new meaning and perhaps it's politically incorrect, you know, to, to say. Um, and so uh, our modern languages, while they are alive, they also are quite fluid and they change. But the truth is not fluid and the truth does not change. And lastly, John, Pope John says that uh, the Latin language is sacred, mm -hmm. precisely that it's non-vernacular. It doesn't really bespeak the things of this world, but rather of something higher. And so perhaps, you know, one could want to have the church change her focus from ultimately a heavenly outlook, trying to get souls to heaven, to something much more earthly. You know, not that we should be neglecting our brothers uh, in need, but if that's all the church is, basically the world's largest NGO, uh, um, to be sort of a spiritual badge of the United Nations, uh, you know, maybe, and again, this is just conjecture, but this is, I think, the qualities unique to the Latin language that um, either some of us would applaud or others might find challenging. Yeah, a couple of examples I thought of when you were saying this. Well, we're recording right now in uh, Christmas tide, and the Christmas songs, you hear the word gay. Used to yeah, mean happy. Exactly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So it changes that quick. And, you know, in the age with uh, technology and different social medias, um, I mean, it's just going to get even uh, quicker, you know, how, how quickly words change in meaning. I know he's, uh, he's, we're not talking about John on this one, but Pope Benedict XVI uh, wrote a thing about uh, encouraging the lady to pray in the language of the church, and he had like uh, 16 prayers for a lady to memorize for this. Uh, mm -hmm. Was that a kind of a step, or did he to push for this, or was that just something different? Well, you know, he had the opportunity as pope, you know, to push in a very, uh, in a very real way. As we were talking about earlier, there's that distinction between, you know, having nice language towards things, you know, sort of lauding an issue of one type or another, versus at what point is it required? At one point does it become legal or illegal? And so I think the closest he got to uh, Latin in terms of speaking on this directly was it was the 50th anniversary of Veterum Sapientia, which ended up being the year 2012. Uh -huh. And he issued a document, uh, Lingua Latina. And I, I mean, he just gives more praise, you know, again, of, of the Latin language, but at the end of the day, we didn't see, all right, seminarians are required uh, to learn X number of semesters or, or anything like that, or certain parts of the mass have to be in Latin. Just those concrete changes uh, just were not done. So what got you into this? What, what did you just stumble on this and go, holy cow, I mean, just <laughs> blow you away? I mean, how did you get involved in the idea of this? Yeah, well, I first liked Latin. And I don't know why I didn't. I didn't grow up with the Latin mass, but in college I discovered it and thought, yeah, this is pretty cool. Um, and so I think there's a, a, a natural attraction to the language. And so I even started studying it before entering into seminary. 
Uh, but another huge thing uh, that helped me to love this uh, language and to become excited about it was the, um, Father Reggie Foster, who, God rest him, he recently passed away, in fact, on, on Christmas Day. But for anybody who doesn't know Father uh, Reggie Foster, he was a, a Carmelite uh, priest, and he was one of the chief Vatican Latinists for four years, and um, which is an absolute character. Uh, he hails from, hailed from Wisconsin, you know, from the family of plumbers. And so he very famously once donned uh, a plumber outfit, essentially, uh, in protest to something or another. And so at any rate, um, I think a lot of our, the bishops in the United States, many of whom studied in Rome, they also studied with Father Reggie. And so he would just say the, the wildest things. And I don't even know what he would um, consider as uh, actually true, or if he would just say to get a rise out of people. But uh, he was he was an incredible, incredible teacher. I encourage everybody who's uh, watching to uh, pray a decade of your rosary uh, for the repose of his soul. Um, I mean, he was a one-man army, essentially, in a time when Latin was dying in the church. You know, this one Carmelite priest was just, you know, day in and day out, keeping it alive, teaching countless students. And so I had the incredible opportunity the summer of 2010 to study with him. His first summer back from Rome, he got really sick in 2008. He started offering summer courses again in 2010 in Milwaukee. And so by a fluke, I was able to study with him, and he was just unbelievable. And uh, we would read anything and everything in Latin, from you know, Plautus and the ancient poets to the most recent Vatican um, document you know, written in, in, in Latin, whether it was he or another who had uh, written it. And so to be exposed to the fathers of the church, the doctors of the church, the medieval greats, um, as well as the Ciceros and the, uh -huh. uh, the pagans, um, it was incredible to see the language come alive. And so he really instilled me a great fire, uh, even larger than what was burning in me for the language. And then at some point, yes, I came across this document. I can't even remember when it was, but as soon as I read it, and by far this document, Venom Sapiencia, is by far the greatest papal document in regards to the Latin language. You have other popes talking about it, maybe addressing you know, certain groups of academics, et cetera. But this is by far the, the most authoritative and the most eloquent in terms of the defense of the language. And so I'm reading this document and I'm thinking, this is incredible. And then I learned that, oh, it was completely ignored. <laughs> then my sense of indignation settled in. I'm like, why did it get it ignored? I mean, this was so important. And, uh, and then I discovered the Ordinaciones, uh, which is another incredible document, which, uh, so my group, Better Sapiencia Institute, uh, we're in the middle of translating these ordinaciones into English, French, and Spanish to make them available because to our knowledge, they're not available in vernacular anywhere on the internet. You can find them in Latin uh, through the Octa, uh -huh. but uh, at any rate, we're gonna try to make this stuff available. And so even reading this document, it just, this is the church speaking you know, full-throatedly on the importance of her own language. And so when you start to reflect upon that, it's like, this is the language of the church. You know, this is the language which for countless centuries, you know, brought our Lord, uh, body, soul, um, body, blood, soul, and divinity on our altar through the most blessed sacrament. Uh, this, these were the words that conferred on us eternal salvation at our, at our baptism. These are the words that really um, encapsulated and protected the faith that we proclaim, and not an esoteric faith that doesn't yield salvation, but precisely one that saves souls. And so you, you begin to reflect upon the nature and the importance of language, in fact, even that the world was created through the Word, uh, and that Christ is the Word of God, you know, you start wondering, well, why wouldn't the Church take her own language uh, that seriously? You know, I think it was Heidegger who said that words are the house of being, not endorsing Heidegger, by the way, but it is an interesting concept that it's precisely our words that enshrine concepts. And the Soviets knew it. That's why they would try to excise uh, words that they did not like, um, et cetera. So you can kind of keep going on and on and on on the importance of language uh, and not to mention for identity, you know, for our own identity. Think of any ethnic group for instance, and how important their language is to them. Think of how important Hebrew is to the Jews or to the Greek immigrants, uh, Greek is to the Greek immigrants um, or to the Greek Orthodox Church. And here we Catholics uh, who have incredible amount of free time and possibilities for education, 
we don't know our own language. Uh, the Greeks have their own Greek school. The, the Jews teach their children Hebrew, um, and yet we are kind of falling short on it. So um, I think it's just very, very simple. I read the document, and I wonder, why isn't anybody doing this? <laughs> and that's it. <laughs> it's like, this is great stuff. Uh, the Church in Wisdom gave it to us. So uh, why isn't anybody doing this? And um, so that got us started working on, well, at least let's try to do something. And that brought up the Institute. So tell us how the gist of that, uh, what is it about, what's the goals? Sure. Well, it really started, um, I think it was a combination of my studies with Father Reggie, but then I uh, discovered Dr. Nancy Llewellyn, who at the time was with Wyoming Catholic College, and she had uh, founded a group called Salvi, which was meant for spoken Latin, to promote uh, spoken Latin. And I happened across one of her weekend courses in West Virginia, and it was no English allowed. It was everybody had to speak Latin, and I was about as loquacious as a church mouse uh, because I couldn't speak a word. Um, but nonetheless, I became instantly convinced of the power and importance of spoken Latin. And I thought to myself, I, you can tell just how deep of a thinker I am. Why aren't we doing this for clerics? <laughs> Let's do this for cleric. Let's have an experience of no English allowed, uh, full immersion uh, for for clerics. And so um, the year after my ordination, I was ordained in 2012, I uh, asked uh, Dr. Llewellyn, would she be willing to do one for clerics? And she said, sure. I called up Father Reggie, you'd be willing to come down? He said, sure. I called a Vatican Latinist, uh, are you willing to come? Oh, sure. So I, I, everybody kept saying yes and yes and yes. And so we had our first conference, week-long conference, called Veterum Sapiencia in 2013. And so we, we've had about eight of those annually. And But slowly that began sort of maturing, this, this idea of, well, we need to do something a bit more than just a week. And so Dr. Llewellyn eventually moved to Charlotte to teach at our new uh, St. Joseph's College Seminary here in Charlotte. And she's brought with her a lot of her living Latin techniques. And so actually our seminarians in Charlotte do get a good amount of it. Um, and so yeah, she and I had been speaking for a few years, a number of years uh, about this, but really there was a missing piece. And that missing piece was a person, Dr. Eric Hewitt, who had co-founded the Paideia Institute Mm -hmm. um, in around 2010. So when Father Reggie got sick and left Rome, uh, he, Eric, and another kind of uh, stepped in his place and they put together this Paideia Institute, which was wonderfully successful. They did great job, great conferences, good online classes. And um, I had been wanting to meet these Paideia guys. And so a couple years ago, about a year and a half ago, uh, I happened to meet uh, Eric at uh, the uh, fraternity's uh, parish in Rome, uh, Trinita. And uh, I'm like, I've been waiting to meet you. And I got the sense, you know, I think he's, he's our guy. And um, uh, about six months later, uh, he left the Paideia Institute. And so Dr. Llewellyn and I approached him and uh, he agreed to come on board. So with his experience of, um, of founding a Latin and Greek Institute online primarily, uh, and his administrative skills, and that was the missing piece. So uh, in January we start, of this year, we started talking, of last year rather, <laughs> uh, we started talking very seriously about doing this. And so uh, it happened. And so we've been you know, we're now incorporated in the state of North Carolina. And so um, we're up and running. And so, but the goal of the Veteran Sapiencia Institute in a way is twofold. Number one is trying to get the word out about what does the church teach in regards to the Latin language? Because we started off saying uh, Vetum Sapientia is one of the least known documents ever, or the most ignored, uh, rather, in, in papal 20th century history, or at least would be a top contender. Um, and so getting that word out, getting the word out about that curriculum that the Congregation for uh, Universities and Seminaries put together, I think that will be very important. And then to begin offering at least the opportunity uh, to any uh, clerics and, and religious who would like to achieve that high level of Latin envisioned by the church articulated in these documents, you know, there may be some, and look, the whole system collapsed, Steve. The whole Latin system simply collapsed. And I mean, we can sit here and bemoan that or we can do something about it. And so exactly with online education, which may not be ideal necessarily, nonetheless, it provides an opportunity. 
And so what we're going to be doing is through online classes and summer intensive programs, try to provide the opportunity to achieve that high level of Latin. And so another very important piece to this, uh, to, to this development is our negotiations currently with the Pontifical Salesian University, in particular, the Pontifical Institute for Higher Latin. So when I mentioned earlier the Latin Academy mm -hmm. that is mentioned in Veterum Sapientia, uh, uh, Paul VI in 1964 actually established it there at the Pontifical Salesian University in Rome. And so uh, since then, you could go over there and get a licentiate or doctorate in uh, classical and Catholic uh, letters, et cetera. So they're the ones formally uh, tasked with helping to implement these, these documents. And so we've had a good uh, working relationship with them thus far. Uh, several of them have come over for our conferences over the last years. And so we're in the middle of negotiating a, um, uh, an agreement by which we can offer a diploma in ecclesiastical Latin. Uh, that would be multi-layered. You know, some may just be interested in getting through the basics and maybe that's all they'd be allowed. Okay, fine. Or, or to try to get to an intermediate level of Latin. So whether it's sort of looking at Latin, the different types of church Latinity, whether it's patristics or canonical or whatever, or just to look at all of it, or to advance even further and to follow to the letter what that curriculum from the Congregation of Universities and Seminaries decreed back in April 1962, actually do it. And so uh, we're hoping to uh, finalize that, that agreement here soon and begin offering accredited uh, classes to that, to that effect. So uh, we are trying to do, uh, to do something about it and at least try to um, you know, uh, jumpstart uh, this, uh, this machine once again. Yeah, I always like saying there's enough complaining about it. Somebody do something about these complaints. So that this is perfect. Um, what have what have clerics so far have said about it? Well, so far we've just had our conferences, the annual conferences, and now as an institute that will the institute will absorb uh, the conferences, which we think will continue such conferences. And look, they've had um, we've had great reviews. We've had returned students, um, and so our conferences. It's not only immersion in Latin, which for the first time Latin speaker is a bit much, they're, they're a bit worn out <laughs> by day two, but by day four, they are amazed by, wow, I can understand about 75% of what's being said. Or the, one of the coolest things is when they learn a concept, because we also, uh, each day is a different type of church latinity. So the first day is usually biblical, then patristic, then medieval, then manualistic or renaissance. We'll read the 17th century Jesuits on their journeys somewhere uh, or modern day um, uh, documents, whatever. But to learn a concept through, uh, through a lecture spoken in Latin and learning that concept directly in Latin and then maybe later being forced to try to translate it into your mother tongue, you know, to, to learn the, the, the church's teaching with the church, with the church's language. Uh, so that's, that's afforded some, you know, great experience. So, um, but we do have uh, online courses in beginning uh, in just next week, actually. Uh, so we're offering about uh, six or eight online courses, both in Latin and some uh, in Greek. And some are just for clerics, others are for anybody. Um, and so, and that's the other thing too. I mean, we don't want to focus only on clerics, although obviously the document was intended for clerics, but we really do hope to provide uh, resources uh, for the lay faithful, uh, whether it's to get through basic Latin grammar or let's say somebody's going to the Latin mass, they want to understand a little bit more uh, deeply what's going on to be able to walk through that, or somebody wants to pray the rosary in Latin, um, you know, we want to develop these resources. Of course, it's going to be, you know, step-by-step -step, uh, things. So Teach the kids who could become clerics. <laughs> yes, exactly. Yeah. And you know, start them young, too. So, um, so there are all sorts of possibilities. Uh, discussing maybe if the Sharp pilgrimage happens this coming year, why not do a speaking group and, and, and do that? I mean, uh, the possibilities are endless. So, but it's just step-by-step -step right now. Where's the, what's the website and what's on the website? So veteramsapientia.org uh, uh, is the website. We're also on all the major social media platforms. Uh, but uh, on the website, 
discusses what online classes uh, we have. It discusses our mission. Uh, we do have a blog, which we comment uh, on various things regarding the Latin language. Um, Is the blog in Latin? No, no, no. <laughs> and we, we've discussed that before. And uh, we'll, we'll see what uh, what may eventually end up in, in Latin. But uh, at any rate, no, currently, no, it's all, it's all in English. Um, but resources, so we'll definitely be having the ordinaciones up there before uh, hopefully too, too long. But just again, to help try to get the, the word out. What would you recommend families do to, I mean, this program or some simple things at the house to better themselves at the language itself? Mm -hmm. Yeah, see, that's uh, be patient <laughs> for now. Because yeah, we get those questions all the time, um, you know, especially like homeschool moms, you know, what can I do? And there are certain programs out there for, for homeschoolers, but nothing's really kind of, uh, you know, stealing the day uh, in its effectiveness and, and uh, you know, obvious appeal so that everybody's going to it. Um, but I think a, a little bit of uh, patience and hopefully whether it's us or it can be anybody, as long as somebody's doing it, right? Um, to make these things, uh, to make these things available um, but also consistency, especially if you are going to the Latin Mass, just uh, keep going. Uh, you know, I think people are very much lost <laughs> the first couple times, but uh, you begin to uh, feel the cadence uh, of, of the diction, of the, of the chanting, and, um, and you get more and more used to it. So it's like anything. You just have to, you have to be around it and, and not give up. But um, just uh, be patient and pray that those resources are made available and available cheaply and easily. I still use your line that I heard from someone else about the, the first time you'll go, you'll be lost. The second time you're intrigued, the third time you're hooked. Yes, the three mass rule. And I definitely stole that from somebody else. So. <laughs> <laughs> but that uh, was true for me. <laughs> What if somebody comes up and says, all right, Father, it's great and all for Mass or, you know, reading the patristics or, you know, reading the old old languages like Augustine's, I heard confession supposed to be sung in Latin, not read in English. Um, what practi what practicality is it good for, for everyday use? Is it is it worth anybody doing it for the normal Joe to help them in a better day? Mm hmm well, you know, Latin, again, used to be not just the language of the clergy, but also the language of the educated. Um, and so, and people just, they learned their Latin letters. And up until a certain point, uh, even, the, you know, the scientists were uh, writing uh, in Latin. And I remember in Father Reggie's class, and we, we read everybody. We read Galileo in Latin. We read Kepler. Kepler was the worst. That, that was the only author I ever saw Father Reggie say, all right, this is enough. He just, he was... <laughs> It was just way too much, uh, <laughs> but uh, it was incredible to or Descartes, uh, you know, to read about these, uh, to read what they said. So, but that's an investment. I mean, Latin is a difficult language, and so I think we need to um, push for our schools and for the education of our youth that uh, they be taught these uh, the, the Latin letters. And it's incredible to read in some of these documents from the church. Uh, because the church understood, you know, in the early 20th century, mid 20th century, that okay, the modern scientists have uh, science, sciences had really taken off, hadn't they? Since you know, the mid mid to late 19th century, your your natural sciences are doing incredibly well. And I think one of the downfalls for Latin was simply the success of those sciences. Um, and there's nothing against natural science, but we shouldn't leave behind the wisdom that is contained in Latin and Greek. And so, you know, we've gotten all this, you know, techno uh, knowledge from our, 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 our natural sciences and technology, but we have left behind wisdom. And so, you know, the church documents say, all right, look, just because the natural sciences have done well, and just because maybe the public schools have an emphasis on them, if somebody's going to enter into a Catholic seminary or a Catholic university, no, sorry, you got to learn your Latin. And those, and you can't, cut Latin in favor of these other subjects. And so I think there has to be an entire um, uh, change of mentality uh, from a uh, practical, hey, what college, what be, what's the best college I can get my kid into based on whatever technical um, you know, training he or she could receive versus to set them up for um, you know, uh, just a broader base of wisdom. So for, you know, 
it's very commonsensical if, if you're a parent and if you're looking at the rate of automation by which jobs are being stolen by your iPhone, um, why encourage your kid to run to a technical college and become specialized uh, in, a, in, in something very narrow? You know, even, for instance, like anesthesiology, you think that's a pretty safe job. Like, no, you already have automated, mm -hmm. and, and it's, and it's, well, I guess they'd be just machines. So it's like, that was the beauty of the classical education by focusing not on a particular skill, but rather on the human mind itself, especially through uh, the Latin language, uh, then you are set up, no matter what happens in the world of automation, at least that you have perfected your mind. So I think there's a big uh, mentality shift that needs to, to change. And then as for, but there may be other people who are, you know, in their 20s or 30s or 40s and are thinking, well, what should I do? Because I can't go redo all my education. And um, I mean, that, that's gonna be tough. Uh, and we'll see what resources will be made uh, available uh, in time. But um, and I don't know, hang in there. You can only pray your Pater Nostra and your Ave Maria. You know what, the Lord can, can work with that. <laughs> uh, for anybody to contact, does it go through the website, contact straight you or? Yeah, so the website would be uh, would be best, you know, info at veteransapiencia.org. Uh, again, we're on all the major social media platforms. Um, if there's some heavy hitter investors, you know, this stuff will progress as fast as, uh, you know, the money comes in. You want high quality uh, resources for lay faithful, for clerics or whatever. Um, you know, it takes, you know, it takes financial support. So. Yeah, yeah. You got some yeah. solid teachers with you, too. Yes, I mean, that's both the blessing and the curse with this endeavor. I mean, uh, precisely because nobody's doing it, we have access to incredible people. Yeah. Um, you know, former Vatican uh, Latinists, uh, Ivy, um, Ivy League professors, um, some great seminary professors from like the, the fraternity and elsewhere, and um, just some fantastic um, instructors uh, who can speak Latin fluently. Some classes are in English, others in Latin, are in Latin, by the way. Um, so, yeah, precisely because so few are doing this type of work, we have access to some incredible resources. Um, people could also sponsor a seminarian or a priest or a religious uh, if they want um, to pay for a class for them. So that's also available through, through our website. So ladies and gents, uh, you know there's a problem out there, so here's a solution. Please help them out. Check the website out. The show notes will have the website underneath. For those who don't know what the show notes is, just click show more. It's underneath the video. Drop down box. You'll see the link. Contact Father Barone and go at it and see what he if you can help them out or send a priest to them or yourself. Uh, Father, any final words? No, I just encourage folks to uh, pray for the success of our initiative and uh, pray that the Latin language uh, return to its uh, former place of uh, prestige and glory. Amen to that. How about a final blessing before you go? Absolutely. Dominus vobiscum. Et cum spiritu tuo. Perucessione beate Maria semper virginis et dominum sanctorum benedictio dei omnipotentis patris et vidii et spiritu sancti descende super vos et maniat semper. Amen. Valate. <laughs>